Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. Well, I have to start off the show by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Your messages, your DMs, your emails, your reviews have been incredible. And I thank you for that because it is like the fuel that keeps you going. There's so much work that goes into these episodes. And to know that you're enjoying what I'm putting out there is awesome. So thank you. Thank you for your reviews. It appears as though the bulk of the people who listen to this show in particular listen via Apple Podcasts. So you can leave reviews there. Five-star reviews are my favorite. All right. I had to redo this segment like three times because I just got the dogs (laughs) to be quiet. I know. You're like, you still, you still haven't soundproofed that area yet. Not completely, but changes are coming. And that will be among them. All right. So everything about the show, crimeofthetruestkind.com. You can listen to the show directly from the website. All the links are there. The great merch. There's some new merch up there. I added the iHeart True Crime logo, which you seem to like. New mug, sweatshirt, or a phone case. You can donate to Buy Me a Coffee, which more of you did. You totally rock. Valley E, Renee R, Sandy, 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 Superstar Sandy. You were totally awesome people. I don't care what anybody says about you. Follow the show's socials at Crime of the Truest Kind on Facebook and Instagram. At Truest Kind on Twitter and TikTok. Yep, I put stuff there. Oh, and on today's show, I will include a promo for another true crime podcast. People in the true crime community, I got to tell you, I did not know this, but I have learned, are awesome. They're awesomely supportive of one another. It is incredible. You will hear a promo for the Grizzly Books podcast coming up. The story I cover on today's show was a national story, an international story back in the year 2000. Court TV aired the trial. It was massive. It was a very big story. It raised a lot of questions about parental behavior around children's sporting events. On today's episode, we travel to Reading, Massachusetts, another town I know very, very well. And the story of the Reading Hockey Dads. Reading, Massachusetts. I've talked about it before. It's the town where Charles Stewart and Carol DeMady Stewart lived when he killed her and their baby Christopher and blamed a black man in Mission Hill in Boston. It was all a lie a vile hoax to cover up the murder of his wife and his baby son, who was due in less than two months. The Stewart case is episode five, so please go back and listen when you have the opportunity. Reading is a pleasant place of not quite 25,000 people, and I lived there too, for a short time. I worked there longer. It's known for its good schools, a youth sports town, I think I could call it. Lots of parents want to put their kids in good schools and nice neighborhoods, who have great sporting communities. There are a lot of kids who may or may not show a talent for sports in those good schools who long for sporting scholarships. They're looking for the payday. That's what I'm getting at. They're looking for the big payday for their kid to get on the majors. I think a lot of parents and kids have that dream together. I remember the fervor at open houses when we were house shopping back then. Bidding wars for shit houses in decent neighborhoods, I actually even heard people taunting one another about the offer that they were going to make on the house. It was terrifying in hindsight. You know, I'm talking way before the real estate chaos of today. It is all out war to buy a house in the current market. Back then, we bought a house in Reading, lived there for less than two years, and sold it because they wanted to build a mall directly across the street from our house. Those neighborhood meetings were interesting and insulting. That's not an indictment on Reading, but developers think everyone is stupid. At least these developers did. Simply put, they were fucking assholes. 
Oh, and Reading didn't get them all. Linfield did. All right, who's from Reading? Lucy Wheelock is from Reading. She was an early childhood education pioneer. And Wheelock College in Boston is named for her. Marcarelli, musician from Reading. Fred Foy is from Reading, radio and television announcer for The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornets, Dick Cavett Show. All right, geeks, I know you like that. Tom Silva, general contractor for this old house on PBS. Okay, so this old house started the whole, like, love it or list it, flip or flop, all of those home improvement shows. This is like the OG home show. Brad Whitford of Aerosmith is a member of the Reading High School class of 1970. Cousin Stiz lived in Reading for a while. He's a Boston rapper that's uh, doing pretty great for himself. Also someone who lived in Reading for a time was Matt Siegel, Maddie in the morning on Kiss 108. And for a time on the almighty 1041 WBCN, RIP PCN. Matt Siegel is the morning radio host who had a fit on the air just the other day when he said his bosses were telling him not to go off on how he didn't understand Demi Lovato's declaration of being non-binary. Okay, you got that out of the way. But he went on to say that he's pretty much the greatest thing Boston radio has ever seen. I think he meant to say Charles Lacodera. Radio. I love radio and I also think it sucks. But I also love it. I spent more than 20 years of my life in radio. And I'll probably do it again. Reading is a big sports town, big hockey town. And fights are not new on the fields or in the courts or on the rink. But it's usually from the players. I did an informal poll among friends and followers asking them, when you were a kid playing sports, do you remember fights breaking out among parents? And I do not. And 80% of the people I asked said never ever do they recall parents starting fights or engaging in fights when we were younger. That certainly has changed, hasn't it? There have been countless incidents in the news of hot-headed parents interfering with their kids' games, complaining of unfairness, who can or who cannot belong on a team. Hey, look, not everyone gets a trophy. One story took center stage, made the front page to this phenomenon of parental interruption epitomizing the worst and going too far in children's sports. Little League throwdowns, soccer mom mayhem, rink rage. It's ridiculous phrasing for absurd behavior. But the latter became synonymous with the Reading Hockey Dads. That's what makes the story I'm about to tell you that much more disturbing. And the fallout from the events of July 5th, 2000 reverberated for years, as we will find out. Both families suffered greatly tragedy was never far and many people paid the price back to that summer day when two dads brought their kids to the local rink to get some time on the ice no one thought a thing about it it's something they had done countless times before the case was dubbed by the media as the rink rage trial and triggered a fierce debate about the rise of adult violence at kids games raising the stakes for the already highly competitive world of youth sports. There are studies, essays, PowerPoint presentations, class discussions. Shit, I'm sure there's a TED talk about it. Step aside helicopter parenting. Here come the bulldozers. Wednesday, July 5th, 2000. A gorgeous summer day in New England. The days we dream about all winter long. Since the holiday fell at the beginning of the week, the rest of the week was kind of a wash. There were enough kids around for a midweek pickup hockey game at the Burbank Ice Rink in Reading, Massachusetts. There's that joke about hockey. I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. Well, on that July day, 44-year-old father of two, Thomas Junta, a truck driver from Reading, brought his 10-year-old son and two friends to the Burbank Ice Arena in Reading for a pickup hockey game. That dad watched what was supposed to be a non-contact scrimmage from the stands. He watched as his son Quinlan got a good shove on the ice, then an elbow to the nose. Oh, that aggravated him. He got tense and went down to the ice to tell the other father who was supervising the game to control the kids from checking and blocking. That other father, 40-year-old Michael Costin, father of four, 
Three of his sons were out at the rink with him that day. He was acting as sort of a volunteer coach and was out on the ice. Thomas Junta was a pretty big guy. He stood six feet one, weighing in at 270 pounds. Now, I imagine that could be menacing to some kids and adults alike. It's not known whether Costin felt intimidated at the time when Junta took it upon himself to tell him he didn't like how the kids were playing. Costin's response to Junta's complaint was what I could call flippant, but a benign response of, hey, that's hockey. Oh, and Junta didn't like that. That triggered a verbal confrontation between the two fathers and seemed to end there for a moment. As the practice wrapped and the kids went to the locker room to change out of their hockey gear, Junta approached Costin as he left the ice. Things turned physical as Junta grabbed at Costin's shirt and snapped the gold chain from his neck. Costin, who was still wearing his ice skates, ripped Junta's shirt and was kicking at him. Other bystanders at the rink that day stepped in to break up the fight, and Junta was escorted out. If it would have ended there, there would be no memory of that day. It would be completely uneventful. One of the countless forgettable stick practices in that rink in Reading that summer. But Junta did come back. And according to Nancy Blanchard, who worked at the rink, she could see that he was angry. She made an attempt to stop him from entering, but she said he pushed her out of the way and into a wall, bruising her arm. Junta and Costin had another confrontation. They began wailing on each other in front of everyone, parents, rink staff, about a dozen kids, including Junta's son and Costin's three boys. It was pandemonium. Seems like a good time to use that word. One mother whose son witnessed the fight and asked not to be identified to the press said Junta hurled obscenities at Costin and the men argued loudly. Junta went into the locker room and started a shoving match until an arena employee separated the men and asked Junta to leave the building. Minutes later, she said, as Costin left the locker room, she thinks to get cold drinks at the vending machine. Junta returned. Soon, Junta had knocked Costin on the ground with his knee in Costin's chest and was beating him. A report from the Chicago Tribune, now, if that's any indication how far the story reached, from one of the kids at the scene, they said that after the 11th or so punch, he threw Costin into a wall and started kicking him. Middlesex County Prosecutor Gerard Butler took it a step further and saying Junta then pinned Costin to the ground with a knee and slammed his head into the floor repeatedly until he lost consciousness. The number of blows inflicted was always in question, with some witnesses saying Junta inflicted more than 30 blows to Costin's head and neck. According to Thomas Junta, the men lunged at each other, and Costin ripped Junta's shirt and kicked him with his ice skates. Eventually, Junta said, Two bystanders separated them. Junta told his son to get dressed quickly and then went to the parking lot to wait. Prosecutors made the claim that he was ordered to leave by an assistant rink manager. Junta told detectives that after a couple of minutes, he worried about his son's safety and re-entered the arena. There, he met Costin. According to prosecutors, Costin tried to punch Junta. Both men were about six feet tall. But at 275 pounds, Junta outweighed Costin by at least 100 pounds. Costin ended up getting pinned to the ground, and he said he threw three or four punches, enough, he admitted, to making his fists sore. Junta said he heard his son and his playmates yelling for him to stop. Then he noticed that Costin was bleeding. Junta got up off the floor, but Costin did not move. One of the Costin boys yelled for his father to get up. He didn't hear him. At 5.50 p.m. on July 5th, Thomas Junta was interviewed by State Trooper David Burke and Reading Police Detective Sergeant Pat O'Brien about the brawl that left Michael Costin fighting for his life. He drove a truck for U.S. Food Services in Everett, and he left his job around 2 o'clock that day. He spoke about the rough play on the ice and how he told the adult who was supervising the game to make the kids stop. He said they were hitting each other, cheap shots the whole way. Mainly the other kids, not our kids. Our kids were just, like, retaliating, Junta said. He said he ran down to the door of the rink and yelled, none of that cheap shot bullshit, 
This is supposed to be fun hockey. That's when Costin returned the dismissive, that's hockey. He reportedly made that comment more than once. Now, Junta was deaf in one ear, and it's possible he misheard him. This came up again and again in the reports of the events that day. And the interview transcripts are a little confusing. For example, in one line, it says Costin had hockey gear on. And in the next sentence, it said that he didn't. So did he or didn't he? I'm piecing that together. Thomas Junta told police that he didn't know Michael Costin, despite the fact that the two very involved fathers were at the rink all the time. And Junta didn't seem to know any of the rink staff on duty that day, including Nancy Blanchard. And he claims that he went back inside the rink before the second most brutal fight because the kids were still in there. The Court TV transcript is 32 pages long. It is linked on the website. The officers brought in a photographer to take pictures of the scrapes and marks on Junta. He had scrapes on his face, on his arm, his left shoulder, and what they call a raspberry on his knee. What I would consider like a skin burn from friction. Before they wrapped up the interview, Junta said, I wish it didn't happen, and I hope the guy is fine. Well, it did happen, and he was not fine. They concluded the taped interview at 6.17 p.m. on July 5th. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Michael Costin is connected to a number of machines that are keeping him alive. He was brain dead. Just as the bystanders to the fight had warned, a major spinal artery in his neck was severed. He was removed from the machines that helped him breathe the next day the same day that Thomas Junta notified authorities that he was leaving for a vacation. Michael Costin was killed. You don't say someone was manslaughtered. Thomas Junta turned himself in four days after Michael Costin died in the hospital. I believe this is when they learned the results of his autopsy. Junta would be charged in the death of Michael Costin. He pleaded not guilty to manslaughter and was released on $5,000 bail. His remaining a free man upset a number of parents, neighbors, and eyewitnesses to what happened at the rink that day. My name is Gisela Kay, and I am a true crime author and the host of the Grizzly Books podcast. Each season of the podcast is based on one of the books that I've written. I've so far written about Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, and Eileen Wernos. While not all of the details from the book are shared in the podcast, I definitely expand a lot more on my thoughts and my personal insights on the cases that I've studied in the podcast. So if you like details, and I mean all the details, then I would say the Grizzly Books podcast is for you. If you'd prefer to check out the books, which are available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook format, you can find that on grizzly books.com. Thanks so much for listening, and now let's get back to Crime of the Truest Kind. The trial was broadcast on Court TV beginning January 2nd, 2002. There was conflicting testimony as to which of the two men threw the first punch. Junta said it was Costin who hit him first. In the initial interview with police, he said he was unsure, while witnesses testified that it was Junta who first grabbed Costin and knocked him to the floor. Also at issue was the number of blows inflicted. Eyewitnesses testified that Costin was punched many, many times. Junta and witnesses for his defense claimed two or three punches. As their children watched, a police report said, Junta knelt on Costin's chest and beat him unconscious. And we know there were a number of witnesses to the fight, and Junta was seen punching him several times in the face and neck. Some testified to Costin's head being slammed on the floor. Now among that chaos, Nancy Blanchard and several witnesses screamed at Junta to stop and that he would kill him if he didn't. Michael Costin suffered through a torrent of blows. According to several witnesses, 
There was a period during the surge of punches where he was fighting and kicking and flailing, but by the time Junta was pulled off of him, he'd stopped moving. The six foot one, 270 pound truck driver had beaten the five foot 11 inch, 160 pound carpenter unconscious. That detail differs slightly depending on which story you read. Fact is, Thomas Junta was considerably larger than Michael Coston. He was fighting way beneath his weight class. EMTs rushed him to the nearest hospital, Leahy Clinic in Burlington, I learned. That hospital, by the way, has been great to me every single time I have been there. Love to those nurses, including you, Nurse Jane, who gave me my first vaccine. I will see you in a couple of weeks. The advanced life support team scrambled to care for him. He never gained consciousness. His son later testified that he rushed to the hospital in the ambulance. And then his father had stopped breathing and had no pulse, and then his heart stopped beating. After two days in the hospital, he realized that what he had just witnessed was that his dad literally had gotten beaten to death in front of him. Thomas Junta testified in his own defense, as did his son Quinlan, who was 12 by then. And man, that is a lot for a little kid to handle. The defense's strategy was to go after Michael Coston as the aggressor in the fatal fight with a planned attack on his character. And the truth is that both men had previous run-ins with the law, and their families suffered a great deal of loss. Coston was just a kid himself when he lost his big brother to a stab wound to the heart. His father, Augustine, who was 42 at the time, says the death was an accident. Family members wouldn't discuss it, or anything about the family, except to make it clear that they don't have any relationship with the senior Coston. A messy situation. Families almost always are. About their father, Michael Coston's sister Mary said, the information he gives you is inaccurate. He isn't considered a part of this family and hasn't been for a while. It was Augustine Coston, father of Michael Coston, who was convicted of manslaughter for the 1976 stabbing of his oldest son, Dennis. Michael Coston was just 15 when his 17-year-old brother, Dennis, was killed. The bitterness between father and son went on for years. Their father eventually did admit that he was a terrible person and shared that Michael started drinking after witnessing the death of his brother. Police said that Augustine Coston stabbed his son once through the heart at the end of an hours long domestic dispute. Prosecutors first charged him with second degree murder. Coston said he grabbed the hunting knife from under his son's pillow during the fight, where Dennis Coston rushed him in their kitchen, running into the knife. A jury in 1976 found him guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. They sentenced him to a year in prison, with the remainder of the sentence suspended, citing his clean prior record. Augustine Coston ended up serving six months on work release for the stabbing death of his 17-year-old son, Dennis, by accident. That sent Michael Coston into the depths of sadness and depression. He developed a drinking problem as a teenager. He got into trouble. According to the state's criminal offender registry, he went to prison seven times between 1983 and 1995 for crimes that ranged from assaulting police officers to breaking and entering with a loaded gun. He married a woman from Ireland, but it didn't last. Prior to his death, Michael Coston's legal problems stemmed from a conflict with his ex-wife. No one could have predicted that his children would witness his murder the apex of traumatic experiences. At the time of his death, 40-year-old Michael Coston had recently won a custody battle for his four children. Three of those children, Brendan, 12, Michael, 11, and Sean, 10, played ice hockey and were there that day. Coston's only daughter, Tara, was nine. Michael Coston's death was so traumatizing to his children that one even tried to climb into his casket at the funeral. It's true that Michael Coston had a difficult personal history. Augustine Coston had been a vocal figure at this trial, claiming that Michael Coston has taken behavior controlling drugs and was being treated for post-traumatic stress. He was hospitalized in a psychiatric unit once, and he was by all accounts, a good dad and was sober 
when he got custody of his kids. With all of this, there was a point where Junta's lawyers said Augustine Costin had volunteered to testify for the defense about his own son's battle with drugs and alcohol. The father denied this, by the way, and accused the defense of exaggerations. But he did acknowledge that his son was troubled. Oddly, I read all of that in a Midland, Texas newspaper, the MRT. Michael Costin was using medications at the time of his death to treat anxiety, depression, insomnia, and seizures. I want to state that this by no means is an indictment of Michael Costin or his past. Michael Costin was killed by Thomas Junta. It was the Junta defense that wanted to exploit this. The judge who presided over the case ruled the defense could not use Costin's mental history or what medications he was taking. The jury would not know, and they would have to rely heavily on the testimony of Junta himself, the defendant. To back up his self-defense story, his lawyers could refer to those photos taken the night he was questioned, the scrapes, the raspberry knee, in court papers, though, prosecutors backed up at least one part of Junta's account, that Costin took the first swing during the fatal fight. The prosecutors would argue that Junta killed Costin in a rage over body checking during the scrimmage. Prosecutors worked to prove that Junta was not acting in self-defense, but in anger. And their strongest witness may have been Junta himself. He told detectives in that interview just a few hours after the altercation, he wasn't afraid of me and I wasn't afraid of him. If Junta did not fear for his life, prosecutors would argue, how can the killing be in self-defense? Junta said in the statement that he had pummeled Costin with both fists until they hurt and heard his children screaming at him to stop even as he hit Costin. Another key part of the prosecution's case was the size difference between the two men. Prosecutors would show the jury pictures of Costin, tall and thin, compared to Junta, large, 270 pounds, and suggest that the smaller man could not have intimidated Junta. Like Michael Costin, Thomas Junta was said to have been a good dad, but he also had a criminal background. He grew up in Charlestown, where he played football for Charlestown High, and had his share of run-ins with the police. Records in Charlestown District Court indicate that in March 1975, Junta allegedly broke into the Metropolitan District Commission skating rink in Charlestown and did $3,300 in damage. He was 17 at the time and charged with willful and malicious destruction of property. He was later found not guilty. The incident came three months after he had been sentenced to a one-year jail term on a charge of using a vehicle without the authority of the owner. Junta appealed that decision, but court records didn't indicate what became of the appeal or whether he served any time. In 1991, the Boston Globe reported, Junta's wife, Michelle, saw and was granted a restraining order against her husband when she alleged he beat her continuously in front of their two children in their Charlestown home. The following year, police arrested Junta on charges he punched a Boston police officer and ripped a gold chain off his neck on a North End corner, according to court documents. Although Junta was again not convicted, the case was continued without finding after he admitted to sufficient facts. A Boston municipal court judge ordered him to pay the officer $250 in restitution, the price of a gold chain. This sort of information is exactly what the prosecution needed to seal the deal in the Junta case. In fact, Mary Kay Ames, a defense attorney and former deputy chief of homicide, said that is going to be huge for sentencing. The defense had an uphill battle to prove what happened at the skating rink was an anomaly. In the recent years before the fatal fight, Junta's record had been clean, so much so that a judge decided to release him on $5,000 cash bail. And well, of course, the people who knew him in Reading, where he had been a truck driver for 13 years, described him as well-mannered and calm and generous and the guy who took other kids under his wing. But his defense team would block any of the prosecution's effort to have the judge consider his past infractions whatsoever. But they desperately wanted the jury to know everything that Michael Costin had ever done. 
It's not clear to me even today if Thomas Junta's priors were ever made known to the jury. The trial lasted eight days, with several eyewitnesses taking the stand, including Junta's 12-year-old son, Quinlan, who testified that he saw his dad fighting. That was traumatic for a 10-year-old boy to see. There was a rink full of kids witnessing that kind of violence. It's ironic seeing as the fight started over what Junta considered rough play among the kids. So he beat the ever-loving shit out of a man in front of those kids. Thomas Junta was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in the beating death of Michael Costin. Thomas Junta was originally charged with voluntary manslaughter. The jury convicted him of the lesser offense of involuntary manslaughter, believing that he did not intend to kill Michael Costin that day, but confirmed that his actions went too far. He was sentenced to six to 10 years. Acting on the state prosecutor's recommendation, the judge in the case gave Junta double what the Massachusetts sentencing guidelines outlined for such a sentence. Naturally, his family was devastated by the sentence, and naturally, they vowed to reverse it. His appeal was rejected, and the parole board rejected his request for release twice, once in 2007 and again in 2008, finding that Junta had minimized his behavior and not fully accepted responsibility for his actions. He was eventually released on August 27, 2010, after serving eight years. He got remarried, moved to Wilmington, got some life back. Hopefully during that time, he got to reconnect with his children, who never deserved any of this. And on December 16th, 2020, Thomas Junta died of pancreatic cancer. He was 63 years old. But the story doesn't end there. Like Michael Costin's childhood anguish and seeing his father kill his own brother, the kids who were forced to witness Costin's beating were subjected to their own trauma. Quinlan Junta, member of the Reading High School Championship Hockey Team 2008, and whose family became the unwitting symbols for parental violence at kids' sporting events. That kid did not sign up for that. None of those kids did. It had to be incredibly hard for him and his family to endure the pain and the stigma of your dad killing another dad in front of all the kids at the hockey rink. Quinlan died in the fall of 2011 at 21 years old. His obituary read that he died suddenly. No official cause is known to the public and quite frankly, I'm not gonna pick up the phone and try to find out from anyone. His death was confirmed by Leahy Clinic in Burlington where Michael Costin died. Quinlan Junta found trouble. He was indicted in March of 2011, along with three other local guys, on charges of home invasion, armed robbery, conspiracy, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, two counts, and assault and battery. On February 7th, 2011, Reading police responded to an apartment in the Archstone complex for reports of a home invasion. When they arrived, police located a 19-year-old male with obvious facial injuries. The victim told police that two men, Quinlan Junta and another man from Reading, entered his home carrying a gun. They assaulted the victim, stole an undetermined amount of money, and fled the scene in a vehicle that the victim was able to identify to police. Michael Costin Jr. was 11 at the time of his dad's death, and he testified in the trial. He also had much difficulty in the years after his father was killed. I imagine watching your dad getting beat to death would do that. He spoke at the trial. After the game ended, we got, we got off the ice. I saw Thomas Junta beating my dad into the ground. For the rest of that day and for the next day, my heart was in my throat. I never, not for a second, stopped thinking of what happened to my dad. Please punish Thomas Junta and do not allow him before I finish, Your Honor. I want you to know what punishment that I hope you give to Thomas Junta for what he did to my dad. First, no matter how much of a sentence that you give to Thomas Junta, my dad got more. My dad will never be back to me and to my family. Thomas Junta will be back to his family. If you give Thomas Junta an easy sentence, 
he may get out and do this again. Please teach Thomas Gentler a lesson. Let the world know that a person can't do what Thomas Gentler did to my dad. Things got much worse for Michael Costin Jr. as he got older. His criminal record lists a number of crimes. Going back to 2007, he was charged with assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, possession of a Class D substance, which is weed, ganj, marijuana. His brother Sean was also charged with disorderly conduct in the same incident and possession of a Class D substance, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, resisting arrest, breaking and entering, domestic assault and battery, violating a restraining order. He had amassed quite a rap sheet. According to a published report, a judge said he was sorry about Costin's father, but it was time to, quote, grow up. In 2013, Michael Costin was arrested for a litany of charges, including domestic violence and drug possession. He was sent to the Middleton jail for 18 months. After pleading guilty to beating up his 43-year-old girlfriend and stealing her car two days before Christmas, the Salem police were called to an apartment on the afternoon of December 23rd by Costin's girlfriend, who said he had grabbed her by the throat, punched her in the face, and told her, you are going to die tonight. Awful. At the very end of my research day, which is all day when I'm writing a new story, I learned what is another tragedy on top of this mountain of tragedies. Michael Patrick Costin died unexpectedly on Saturday, May 25th, 2019. He was 30 years old. It's like the trickle-down effect for sins of the father. Those kids sure did pay. There's nothing saying that these boys would not have had the problems that they did, or whether they'd have met these certain fates if what happened on that July day in 2000 did not happen. I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that if Thomas Junta and Michael Costin did not get in that fight that day, and if Junta did not beat him to death and he did not go to prison for eight years, and if those children didn't have to see what they saw, that maybe just maybe things could have been different for all of them. Look, I know parenting is hard. There's that delicate balance of letting them be who they are, but also safeguarding against whomever it is that they become not be a narcissistic asshole. There's the guilt, the responsibility, the sheer terror of being in charge of a small to medium human being. And you worry about what you do and what you say and how you say it and how something may affect that small to medium human being you're trying to keep alive. There was then, and sorry to say still is, a problem. What we once called helicopter parenting, as I said early on, has turned into bulldozer child rearing as your new enemy. Parents will doze you out of the way, steamroll you. I cannot imagine what teachers go through on a daily basis dealing with some of these parents. You are the true heroes. Thomas Genta served eight years. Does the time fit the crime? He killed a man. He left four children without a father. Being a bad kid, being an alcoholic, even stealing from someone, none of that is a crime punishable by death. I'm quite sure people vilified Michael Costin for a history of offenses, and that's completely unfair. And to say that Junta is a murderer who should go away for life, well, does that fit the crime? He went to jail, he got out, and he is no longer alive today. So there's nothing more that can be said about that. Over the years, parents have invested much money and time into kids' sports for a few reasons, to keep them active, socialization with the hopes of being scouted by the majors one day. While what Junta did that day at the rink may have been uncharacteristic of him, Michael Costin is still dead. Two sets of kids lost their dad, and two families were changed forever. I'm very sorry for the Costin family. I'm very sorry for the Junta family. It is a burden to bear and supremely unfair to those kids, for sure. My hope for them 
is that they have been able to deal with the trauma that they experienced on that day and the days after. Thank you for listening. I'm going to think about your kids' hockey game a little bit differently now. Crime of the Truest Kinds, available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Apple Podcasts, leave a review. Five stars are my favorite. Drop me a line. Crimeofthetruestkind.com has all of my contact information. You can email me right there. Drop by the merch store. There is some swanky brand new merch you are so going to dig. Buy me a coffee that supports the show. You have been truly outstanding in your support. I thank you times one million. And lastly, follow the show. Online everywhere, crime of the truest kind. Facebook, Instagram, at truest kind on Twitter and TikTok. YouTube, follow the YouTube channel. I post every show up on YouTube. I make a fancy little vid to accompany. My name is Angel Wood. This is Crime of the Truest Kind. Thank you for listening. Until we meet again, lock your goddamn doors.